Okay, guys, let's uh, take a look at Chapter 13 for discussion of spinal cord. There, Figure 3.1, we can see the uh, <clears throat> we can see there the uh, a figure there of the spinal cord. Now, what the spinal cord is is that it's a long tubular organ, right? And here we can see the location of the spinal cord. Okay. And uh, we have looked at the anatomy, most of, most of the anatomy of the spinal cord in lab class. However, today we're going to look at mainly the, the, uh, some of the basic parts, but also the physiology as well. Now, very quickly, just want to take a look at the uh, functions of the spinal cord. And the spinal cord has four main functions, okay? Four main functions. Uh, one of the functions is conduction, okay, conduction. So it will transmit or conduct nerve impulses down and up your nervous system, okay? So that's what, uh, that's one function of the spinal cord. Another function is neural integration, neural integration, okay? Neural integration means this is where, within the spinal cord, where the signals, right, the sensory and the motor signals will come together, where they will be integrated, where they will be associated together, okay? And then we have number three, locomotion. So spinal cord is very important for movement of your body. Uh, a person who suffered spinal cord injury or a, a destruction of spinal cord will begin to suffer of a condition known as paralysis okay so uh, locomotion is another important function and then lastly reflexes spinal cord very important for reflexes and we'll take a closer look at reflexes at today's uh, the end of today's discussion as well okay so that was some of the basic functions of the spinal cord okay now let's take a look at some of the basic anatomy of the spinal cord. For this, I'm going to change the different diagram. And let me see, perhaps this is a helpful diagram. Uh, we have a few other diagrams that we can use, but we'll use this one. And something similar to this we saw in lab class. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a transverse section of the spinal cord. Okay, so when we take a, when we take the spinal cord and cut it horizontally through a transverse section, what you will see is that there are two areas there, one that is lighter colored and another area that's darker colored. You can see that as well on the bottom figure, a lighter colored area and a darker colored area. So those two areas are referred to as the white matter and the gray matter. Okay, so now here you can see with the figure, the different portions of the white matter. Okay, the white matter is distributed into these sort of columns. Okay, these columns, okay, posterior, lateral, and anterior columns. Okay, and how do I know what is the posterior section or the anterior section? From what you see right here. So on the anterior surface of the spinal cord, you see there an important sort of wide groove known as a fissure. Therefore, this is called the anterior median fissure and that gives you an indication that this is the anterior part of the spinal cord. So knowing that, that therefore would describe this as being the anterior, the anterior column and then also for the gray matter as well. Okay, so we'll look at the gray matter too in a moment. <clears throat> All right, guys, so let's now continue and move on to, uh, so white matter. So now the white matter, why is it white colored? What makes it look white? So if we took a sample of white matter from here, from a real spinal cord, or with a figure, let me see if I can find a figure, not that one. That's a serious case of the spinal cord. Okay, but if we took a section of the spinal cord white matter, and we magnify it, we would find in here, within this white matter, we would find mainly and mostly bundles of myelinated axons. Bundles of myelinated axons. Now, bundles of axons in the spinal cord 
in the central nervous system or spinal cord are referred to as what? Bundles of axons in the spinal cord are called what? It's shown right here on the figure. Some of them are highlighted in green, some of them are highlighted in red. Bundles of axons in the central nervous system are called tracts. Okay, you see right there, tracts, like railroad tracts. Well, railroad tracts is spelled differently, but tracts refers to these bundles of axons that go up and down the spinal cord, right, within the central nervous system. So, within these tracts, we find bundles of axons, and most of these bundles of axons and most of the myelinated axons are found here in the white matter, and that's what makes the white matter look clearer in color, because it consists mostly of myelinated axons. Okay, great. So that is the white matter. Okay, questions? Yes, did you have a question? Uh, no? Okay, so then we could just go back to the figure again from a moment ago. I'm going to skip that one. And now continuing to look at some basic anatomy here. If you look at the gray matter now. Now the gray matter is found deeper. It's found deeper and deeper underneath the white matter. So this is your white matter and deeper underneath you find the gray matter. If you look at the gray matter here for the spinal cord, you'll see that it has a typical shape. What typical shape would you describe that as for the gray matter? A butterfly. Very good. Or I've had some students say that it looks to them like the bat signal, right? The Batman signal or a bat. Anyway, this is a very typical uh, shape for the gray matter. Okay, guys, you should be paying ten attention. Don't worry about looking for that now. <clears throat> okay, you can look for it afterwards. Now, the gray matter, why is it gray? Any idea? We did mention it in lab class, but see, let me see who remembers. Why does the gray matter have that darker appearance? because it has a lot of non-myelinated axons. Yes, there are some non-myelinated axons. What else do you find in the gray matter that actually gives it that dark color? You find a lot of dendrites. So dendrites are not myelinated. They're never myelinated, so they will also look darker. But something else, very important. In the gray matter of the central nervous system, you find mostly and mainly Neuron what? Neuron what? Somas, right? Neuron bodies or somas, right? So neuron bodies or somas. The bodies and then soma of, of thousands and thousands and millions of neurons within the gray matter of your central nervous system. And in this case, in the spinal cord, the gray matter is found like this deeper under the white matter. In the brain, there is also gray matter, but the arrangement is the opposite. In the brain, which we'll see next week, the gray matter is arranged on the outer surface rather than deeper inside. But they both have mostly the same structures, right? The gray matter has mainly neuron bodies and also dendrites and some unmyelinated axons. So that's what makes it look darker in color. Yes, do you have a question, uh, Gavin? You can type it or just say it. Uh, would you say that the, the, the bodies of the neurons are in, I mean, the axons of those neuron bodies extend into the white matter, or are those like different axons? Very good, yes, correct. So the axons of these neuron bodies, which are clustered here in the gray matter, extend their axons out, right, extend their axons out, which will then pass through the white matter and then go into these cords that you see here, like the anterior, uh, the anterior cord and the posterior one as well, and so forth, right? Uh, the roots, the roots that we mentioned, uh, as you can see right here as well, the anterior root and posterior root. So the axons are mostly located in these cord-like structures, whereas the bodies are going to be located mainly here in the gray matter. Did that, did that clarify? Yeah, 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 it was perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. And you can somewhat see that if you enlarge the picture here of the lumbar uh, part of the spinal cord here, you would see there that the white matter looks more like, uh, like lines because it's axons, whereas the gray matter looks more like circles and bumps because that is mostly bodies.
Okay, we have to magnify a lot greater though. Okay, and I think there's a picture. Let me see if I can go back to the very first picture of the chapter here. Oh, here you can see neuron bodies. These are neuron bodies clustered together there in gray matter, whereas most of the axons would be out here in the white matter. Now, the dyeing techniques that they used here actually colored these two different parts, purple and blue, instead, so that we could actually see with a microscope slide. But in reality, they would look more like what you see right here from a freshly cut spinal cord section it would look more like this. Okay, great. So that would be uh, some of the basic anatomy here. Now, go on, I want to go back to what I mentioned just about a minute ago to these things called roots. Okay, roots. Okay, here's an anterior root. So now that you know this is the anterior part of the spinal cord, in this case, this would be anterior part of the spinal cord, then this would be the anterior root. Thus, back here would be the posterior portion, and therefore this would be the posterior root. Okay, so now we can see now, now we can see more closely with this figure, and here's the anterior and the posterior root. Now what is what is found in these two roots are going to be parts of ac parts of neurons and uh, and axons, okay, which then bundle together and form these roots. So let's take a look at each one of these roots. The these two right here, this one, and on the other side, this one, these are your anterior roots. Now the anterior roots exit out of the anterior surface of the spinal cord like this, and then they bundle together and form an anterior root, which is carrying, with some arrows I'll draw the direction, which is carrying right here, See if I can draw some arrows. Okay. It's a little bit hard to draw tiny arrows with this. But there you go. Okay. You can see the direction of my red arrows. And therefore, it is transmitting or trans, uh, you know, conducting in this direction out of the spinal cord, right, through the anterior roots. So the anterior roots are mainly going to contain the axons of motor neurons. Now the motor neuron bodies will be inside of the gray matter, but the axons then come out like this and then follow through into the anterior roots. So your anterior roots will contain, here here's another anterior root smaller, okay, the anterior roots contain the axons of motor neurons. Motor neurons which are sending signals to different effectors of your body. Whereas the posterior root, back here, this is the posterior root, actually beginning right about here and continuing this way. And I'll use some arrows as well to show the direction of the nerve impulse transmission. The, the dorsal roots, or vent, they're called posterior roots or dorsal. By the way, dorsal means the same as posterior. And let me draw some arrows here. It goes this way. It reaches this bump that you see there. Then it continues this way. And then it continues into the posterior horn of the gray matter. Okay, so the blue the blue arrows that I drew show the tra the transmission, the conduction of nerve impulses that go through the dorsal roots into the posterior horn of your spinal cord. This is the posterior horn of the gray matter. So these posterior roots or dorsal roots. As they send signals through the posterior root, they will come through a bump that you see right here, a bump which forms like a knob. You can see it on the other side as well. That bump or knob-like structure is called the ganglion of the posterior root. The ganglion of the posterior root, also known as the posterior root ganglion or the dorsal root ganglion. Okay, so as the axons go through these different parts, they will pass through a bump there called the ganglion and then continue into the posterior part of the gray matter. Okay, so what type of sensory signals, oh, I gave it away. Sensory signals are going through the posterior roots. So that was my question though. What type of signals pass through these posterior roots? And the answer was sensory signals. And sensory signals go like this through the posterior root 
and into the spinal cord, right? Where are these sensory signals coming from? So now I can ask you that instead. Where are the sensory signals coming from? Give me just one example of a place from your skin, right? From your right from the from the skin in your extremities, from your muscles, from your joints, from, even from your visceral organs, which are sending sensory signals because your sensory organs also feel things. As I mentioned, your stomach can feel a stomach ache or irritation. Your trachea can feel irritation from cold or smoke in the room, and so on. So sensory signals will travel through the posterior route, and therefore you will find sensory neurons and axon, sensory neuron axons in the posterior route. Okay, so that was just some basic anatomy. Now, why did I want to go over that basic anatomy? Well, so that we can look at this right out here. So here's my posterior root, and here's my ventral root. And when they come together right about here, when they come together, oops, that wasn't good. Let me use a different color. Okay, going back to shapes again. When they come together right about here, what do they form? Now, I guess you can look on the opposite side if you're not sure. They form spinal nerves. Spinal nerves. Okay, so right out here we have a spinal nerve. Let me erase some of these lines. So right here we have an example of a spinal nerve. Okay, on the opposite side it's already labeled. Now, spinal nerves, these are mixed structures. Why are they mixed? From what we just said. They are mixed structures because they carry motor signals, but also sensory signals, right? They carry motor and sensory signals, okay? So these are mixed structures in function. They carry motor and sensory signals. Now, the spinal nerve is where these two roots come together and join together, and then they form this structure. Now, let's take a look at spinal nerves, therefore. Now, with the previous diagram, or in fact, let me see if there's another diagram to show us that. By the way, here's a nice figure that shows you some of the basic anatomy as well. Here's my vent ventral root, or anterior root, and the posterior root back here. And here's a spinal nerve. Now, the human spinal cord, okay, you can see right here. Is actually going to have 31 pairs. Why pairs? Because you have a spinal nerve on each side of the spinal cord, one on the right side and one on the left side. So altogether, 31 pairs, if you counted all of this, you will add up to 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Now, the 31 pairs are shown on this figure, okay, figure 3.1. So let's go over the 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so uh, first the first eight. Okay, now here the first eight. Now it says C1, C2, C, they're labeled with capital letters, right? Like C1 for the first cervical, and then C2 and C3 and so forth. So therefore, the first few, the first seven, are what? Anyone know what C stands for? what the letter C stands for? The cervical spinal nerves, right, the cervical nerves. Okay, good. So, <clears throat> can we see all seven with the figure? Yes, you can actually even count them. C1 is up here, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6. There's actually, no, actually, there is seven lump cervical vertebrae, but we're gonna have we're gonna have trouble when we add up at the end. Let me write that down so we don't have a misunderstanding. There is C one, two, C eight. I thought there was only seven. No, there's actually eight cervical spinal nerves, seven cervical vertebrae, but 
eight spinal nerves. And the reason is because eight cervical spinal nerve. The reason is because you have an additional spinal nerve above the atlas. The atlas, which is your first cervical vertebra, right? So above it, you have an additional one, and that for it, therefore it will add up to eight. So the diagram here is a little inaccurate. It should say it should say C8 as being the last one, not C7. I guess C7 is identifying the seven vertebrae, but there are eight cervical nerves. Okay, I'm going to actually type that word in as well. <clears throat> okay, nerves. So C1 to C8, this is how we identify them. Now, in the next region, the next region right here, this large region which measures over a foot long, okay, that region right there is called the thoracic region. Therefore, we will use the capital letter T to identify the thoracic nerves. There are the same number as the number of thoracic vertebrae. So therefore, how many thoracic nerves in total? Anybody know? 12, correct. T1 to T12 nerves. Okay, 12 thoracic spinal nerves. Okay, so that actually matches up nicely with the number of vertebrae. Now, in the next region down here, underneath the thoracic region, we have then our lumbar region. And the lumbar region of the spinal cord will off five lumbar nerves, which is equal to the number of vertebrae. So let me type that word down, L1 to L5. Oops, I want to put L, L1 to L5. Okay, so five lumbar nerves. Okay, then, okay, then we have, now the spinal cord ends somewhere around the third lumbar vertebrae. It ends around here, but it continues to form, it continues to form here nerves nerves that continue to come down even further lower and these nerves down here lower then emerge out of the sacrum and therefore they're called the sacral nerve the sacral spinal nerves now there are they are labeled as s1 2 how many does anyone know how many sacral nerves five okay good five why are there five if there's only one sacrum why are there five sacral nerves? Here you can see the sacral nerves. How come five when there's only one sacrum? Okay, very good. Because at one time in development of your bones and skeletal system, there were actually five separate sacral vertebrae, which then fused into one bone, one bony structure called sacrum. So that is the reason why there are five sacral nerves. And then lastly, we have one last pair. One last pair one on the left side and another on the right side, one pair, so two nerves here, and they're abbreviated as CO, capital C, lowercase o, one. The one means just one pair. So let me write that down. By the way, this is not a standard abbreviation, but I'll put it just like it is in the book. The CO stands for what? Anybody know? coccygeal nerves, right, the, the two coccygeal nerves, one pair only, one for the right side and one for the left side, so that is, that's why you see CO1, the coccygeal nerve pair, okay, so just one, now add it all up together, 8 plus 12, plus 5 and 5, and one pair, all together there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves, okay, now, <clears throat> These spinal nerves will often send branches out and come together and form what you see right here. Let me show you with a figure. So here's a different figure, okay? These spinal nerves 
can so here's some of the examples of spinal nerves C1 and C2 and colored in purple right they often will form branches and they, they will then come together like this some of the branches come together and then they form here a network right here what you see there let me circle with a green arrow or a green line right here you see a network okay a network of branches of the spinal nerves that have come together and formed something known as a plexus. So here, the word plexus, plexus means a group of spinal nerves and their branches joining together and forming a complex network. That's what a plexus is. A plexus actually means a network or a net. So, <clears throat> Here's an example of a plexus. Now, we're not going to review the different plexuses, but what these plexuses do, as you see right here, is that they supply important body regions. They supply important body regions, such as this example of a plexus. This is a plexus right here, and this plexus, known as the cervical plexus, will supply your neck, your shoulder, and your head. Okay? So, again, plexuses, nerve plexuses are where spinal nerves and its branches join together and form a complex network. Here's another example of a plexus. Right here in your, in your armpit. And right here you have some of the nerves that come together to form that plexus. You have C5 and C6 and so on and T1 come together and form this complex network here. And that network, which is right there underneath your armpit at the beginning of your arm, is known as the brachial plexus. Brachial meaning arm. So this is going to supply your upper limbs, your arms. Okay? And here's a real figure, a real photograph of, the, uh, of part of the brachial plexus right there. The brachial plexus will give off many important nerves, like the nerve that you have in your elbow known as the ulnar nerve and so on. So you have many other plexuses as well and these are again complex networks that are formed by spinal nerves that come together and its branches. Here's another plexus and we're just going to skip the rest okay because we're not going to really discuss much about plexuses but what they do is that they serve an important region and part of your body. Okay, so, <clears throat> well, now I want to go on now to, to look at some other figures and other uh, things about, about um, spinal nerves. One important uh, thing that is associated with spinal nerves is this, what you see right here, known as dermatomes. So dermatomes are an important, uh, an important function or role of the spinal nerves. So we did mention that earlier some of the important functions were conduction, neural integration. So dermatomes provide some sort of conduction and neural integration. Okay, but let me describe what dermatomes are. The word derma means what? What is it in reference to? Okay, to part of your skin. Okay, to the deeper part of your skin. Okay, good. So dermatomes is to the deeper part of your skin all right so this has to do something with skin so dermatomes what these dermatomes are and here you have you can see on the figure here throughout the body different examples of dermatomes we have dermatomes around the neck we have this dermatome around the upper chest that extends into the arms we have this dermatome in the middle of your belly and, the, and so on and so on. Here's another important dermatome. Okay, and I'll give you one more example in a moment. But dermatomes, what dermatomes are is that they're areas of the skin, areas of the skin that are supplied sensation, areas of the skin that are supplied sensation by a specific spinal nerve, by a specific spinal nerve. So let me ask for an example. Uh, you can name it by 
it's letter and number simply okay but what dermatome what dermatome supplies or is the dermatome that is being supplied by uh, that is supplying nerve sensation right sensation to your cheeks to the lower part of your cheeks C2 okay good so C2 is the spinal nerve that supplies sensation to the skin there on the lower part of your cheeks okay let me try another example how about uh, in the middle of your belly right around where you have your belly button what spinal nerve covers that dermatome the dermatome around your belly button you don't have to be you don't have to be exact but yeah about T10 would be about right T10 or looks like it's T10 so that would be a good guess okay T11 perhaps maybe so somewhere between T10 and T11 okay good so you got the idea now okay so I'll give you I'll give you one more example though and for instance take your middle finger okay and touch the edge of your desk or table wherever you're studying at and you can feel that that's sort of sharp and that's sort of smooth okay unless you have an old uh, an old uh, wooden desk and then you might get a splinter so be careful but you can feel that and you're feeling the surface there of the edge of your desk with a dermatome there that you have on your middle finger what dermatome is the one that supplies sensation to the skin on the middle finger not C8 but C7 you can look right here at the diagram C7 okay uh, perhaps I'd have to make the diagram larger can I do that yeah you can see right there C7 okay so C7 uh, C7 is the dermatome for the sensation of the skin on your middle finger so next time you want to insult someone don't stick up your middle finger but just simply say C7 to you too whatever okay so Anyway, you get the idea of what dermatomes are. So these are specific areas of the skin that are supplied sensation through a specific spinal nerve. Okay, and the only region of the body that does not have sensation uh, through a dermatome is the face, most of the face here, the upper middle part of the face. And that is supplied sensation by what? What supplies sensation to the upper and middle parts of your face and head? Any idea? Any clue? The cranial nerves. Okay, good. The cranial, not plexus, but cranial nerves, which we'll dis discuss and learn about next week. So cranial nerves, such as the trigeminal nerve, will supply sensation to your forehead and to your to your nose and and uh, upper lips and so forth. Uh, another nerve will provide sensation to your ears and the back of your head. So those are cranial nerves. However, spinal nerves provide dermatome sensation. Okay, with the exception of only one. Do you see any dermatome missing from my list? Well, most of them are listed here, but the exception is one. The list is in, the list here on the table, by the way, is incomplete. It's C1. Yes, the coccygeal nerve, it does provide sensation. The coccygeal nerve provides sensation to the area of skin around the anus. So we don't have a posterior view here. That's why you don't see some of the nerves. However, C1 is the only spinal nerve that does not, that is not associated with a dermatome. So you might wonder, so what is the role of C1? C1's role is to form the cervical plexus that we saw earlier and also C1 might have some role with it also has a role with movement but as far as dermatome C1 does not really have a role here okay <clears throat> so that was uh, dermatomes all right now what I want to move on is one other important function of of the uh, of the spinal cord and that is reflexes 
reflexes. So let's take a look at reflexes. The first thing we want to do is define define a reflex. So be able to define a reflex. Okay. Anyone remember what the definition of reflex is? Would like to try? It is a type of response that is what? Involuntary, good. What else? Does the response happen after a few minutes after triggering a stimulus? No, it's rapid. Okay, good. So it's a involuntary, rapid, and stereotyped. Stereotyped. Stereotype or programmed. Stereotype programmed means now all those other words that you're giving me immediate, rapid, fast, quick mean the same thing in matter of milliseconds. So it's very fast. But it is also involuntary, so meaning it happens on its own. It happens automatically when you use a stimulus. But also it is stereotyped. Stereotype or program means that it has an expected response. A response that you will expect. So such as, for instance, in this case, you can see with the reflex hammer, you do this type of reflex. The expected response would be extending the leg forward. Okay, which I'm sure that many of you tried at home. Perhaps not with a reflex hammer, but you found something else to use. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, so that's some of the characteristics of reflexes. However, a reflex is a response, a response. So here you have the response, the kicking of the leg in the example here, a response to a stimulus. So it is a response to a stimulus. And here the stimulus would be the tapping with a reflex hammer. And the response would be the extension of the knee and leg. So it is a response to a stimulus. Therefore, if you get a person who's jerking their legs without any stimulus or jumping their arms or moving their arms like, like it looks like they have some type of uh, massive shaking or twitch then that is not a reflex because a reflex must initiate with the stimulus and a reflex then carries out some final response so those are some key words to the definition of reflex so once again let me go over that a reflex is a is an involuntary quick stereotyped response to a stimulus so you have to have all these different ingredients and characteristics. Now, the reflex, as you see with this figure, this is a nice figure, okay, to understand a reflex. The reflex is carried out through something that you see here known as a reflex arc. This is a reflex arc. Let's see if they have another figure to show us the parts of the reflex arc. And here with figure 1322, whoops, 1322, you can see there uh, also with uh, nice detail the reflex arc in a special type of reflex. Now we'll go over the types of reflexes in a moment, but we'll use this type of reflex to demonstrate the parts of a reflex arc. So let me type that word down. Reflex arc. There are five parts to the reflex arc. So the first thing is you have to have a stimulus. The stimulus then will trigger the first part of the reflex arc. Now the first part of the reflex arc will be located right about here where it says number one. Okay, will be located right there within the tendons or muscles of your body. Okay, so it's found there within the tendon. And what we have there in the tendons or in the muscle in this example would be the first part of the reflex arc which is the number one now I don't think these numbers these numbers do not necessarily refer to the uh, the the five parts of the reflex arc because you can see that the number goes over five but what these numbers perhaps review is just simply the different steps but I'm gonna list here the parts number one the reflex arc first part is the sensory receptor 
So the sensory receptor, this one, the sensory receptor is the one that actually will perceive the stimulus. So here's the stimulus. In this case, the stimulus might be tapping with a reflex hammer. It could be some other type of stimulus, or a pinch, or a pin, or a hot uh, a hot item, maybe like a, a, a radiator, whatever. That would be the stimulus, and that would set off and trigger. That would that would stimulate the sensory receptor. So the sensory receptor detects the stimulus. So the stimulus is right. The sensory receptor is right about here, within the muscles and skin of your body. But then that sends the signals through this, through that neuron that we have here. Now the neuron that goes through here is the neuron that, if you follow the arrow, would enter into the spinal cord. And therefore, that neuron is described as what type of neuron, which I'm going to list as my second part of the reflex arc. The sensory neuron, okay, sensory neuron. Okay, so then that would take us to... Okay, that would take us to my third part right here. Right about here, you can see that the sensory neuron reaches the spinal cord. And here in the gray matter, the sensory neuron, right, will then communicate with other neurons or with this neuron that will emerge out of the spinal cord. Okay, so this center here, this place is a site of integration therefore this is where the sensory signals integrate with motor signals and this would be your number three okay number three the integration center integration center okay so the, the integration center just a few more things about integration center. The integration center would be the area here in the gray matter of the spinal cord. So remember, this is the gray matter where the sensory neuron signals and the motor neuron signals will associate, will be integrated and processed. So now we have my fourth part, which I just mentioned like two, three seconds ago. And the fourth part is what? And you see it begins there with a red circle and then it continues into a red fiber. Or I'm sorry, a, a, yeah, it could continue into a red fiber or the blue one as well. That would be number four. The fourth part of the reflex arc is therefore those two arrows that are going out of the spinal cord. They would represent what? Number four. The afferent, okay, also known as the motor neuron. Okay, the motor neuron. And then lastly, we have the fifth part. The fifth part is either a tendon or a muscle. And here you have some examples with uh, where you reach the end there at a skeletal muscle or or some other type of muscle and that would be the muscles and glands of your body are known as the effectors so these are your five parts of a reflex arc the sensory neuron so let, let's go through it again the sensor I'm sorry sensory receptor which is found here in the tendon or in your skin then sends the signals to the sensory neuron into the integration center then out the motor neuron and to the effector, the effector, which in this case is a muscle, skeletal muscle. Okay, and therefore the skeletal muscle will carry out the response. The response in this example would be the jerking or the extension of the knee and leg. Okay, so these are all the components of the reflex arc, plus not forget that it must have a stimulus and to produce a response. So that would cover reflexes. Now we want to classify our reflexes as well. 
So one of the classifications of reflexes is based by the structures or st the structure or structures that mediate the reflex. And in all these examples that I've shown you so far, this example, this example, this example, what is the main structure of the nervous system? What is the main structure of the central nervous system that is mediating that is mediating the reflex? Okay? What is the main structure that mediates the reflex? Right here. What structure is that? The spinal cord. Okay, good. So, we can classify reflexes based on the structure that mediates the reflex. And one classification, therefore, would be that type. And therefore, we would have two, two types within this first classification. So let me write that down. Classification of reflexes based on the mediating, based on on the mediating structure and one type is like you see in this figure or the other examples would be, would be spinal reflex and the other would be cranial now I don't have pictures in this chap chapter for cranial reflex but the classification based on the mediating structure would be first of all spinal reflexes those are the kind that the reflex will pass through and be integrated at the spinal cord. So this is a good example of a spinal reflex. And the others I've shown you also are spinal reflexes. But then you have a second type. And those are the reflexes that are mediated by the cranial nerves. The cranial nerves, which we will take a look perhaps at next week. The cranial nerves, such as you have nerves for your eye, you have nerves in your throat, you have nerves for the sense of smell and taste and so forth. All those cranial nerves are the ones that will can mediate and produce some type of reflex. An example would be take light and shine it into someone's eyes and the reflex that you're doing is the pupil reflex, right? The pupil will get smaller when you shine light in the person's eye. So those are the two types of basic reflexes based on their classification as mediating structures. Now, the other classification that we're going to take a look at is the reflexes based on the type of response. So let me write that down. Classification by type of response. Okay, so classification based by the type of response. Okay, and there, there we have two types also, but the two types are named differently. They're called somatic and visceral. Okay, somatic and visceral. Now, somatic would mean what? Somatic is a type of reflex. So based on a type of response, somatic would mean that the response is what? The so response is carried out by skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles. So the example that we have here, where you see a skeletal muscle responding, either contracting or some other thing, when the skeletal muscle contracts or does something, that would be a somatic reflex. And therefore, in the example that we have here, this would be a somatic reflex, when the response is carried out by a skeletal muscle. With visceral reflexes, the response is carried out by the other types of muscles, meaning smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and also glands. Can you actually set off a reflex for these structures to produce some type of response? Of course. Take, for instance, smoke in the room right smoke in the room may cause the smooth muscle in your airways to respond and constrict the airways so that all that smoke doesn't go deeper into your lungs or for instance the pupils of your eyes are are constricted by smooth muscles how about glands 
anyone give you an example of a glandular response? Which is also visceral, by the way. So visceral responses are either smooth cardiac muscle or glands. And what type of response example could you give me with a gland? Who remembers the um, the um, experiment of Professor Pavlov? What happened to that experiment? The salivary glands, correct. So you saw when the dog smelled food or heard a bell or some type of stimulus began to salivate through the salivary gland. So there you go, some examples of visceral reflexes. So visceral reflexes is carried out by smooth cardiac muscles and then also glands okay so those are the two types of reflexes based on this classification now the other classification there is one last classification is based on the clinical response clinical meaning what you actually observe in a clinical setting or with a patient okay and here you can see what you observe here right clinically or what you are observing as you carry out this type of experiment is you see that the leg will kick forward okay so based on the clinical response here's another example which is actually the same thing okay and then here you have another one where you have a person step on something sharp and you can see the clinical response or so the response was right away pull the leg away and also you have their leg their other leg extend this at the same time as well so these are all types of reflexes based on their clinical response where a body part a body part will provide and carry out some type of movement some type of specific movement okay now we're not going to discuss these three types but you can see here an example would be no not this one example here with figure 1322 is a stretch reflex a stretch reflex is a type of uh, reflex where you stretch a tendon like in this case with a hammer and the leg kicks forward or in this case you pinch you pinch a part of the body like the foot or a person's toes a person maybe who's bedridden at a hospital you might want to pinch their toes and see if they have any type of reflex okay and that is called a withdrawal reflex they withdraw a body part that's feeling pain an extension a crossed extension reflex that is on the other body part the opposite side of the body often can perform some type of response as well such as with you pinch someone's toe you might not only get that person's leg flex or withdraw but it is also will show up with extension of the opposite leg extension so here's a good case where a person stepped on something sharp that leg that felt the pain flexed and withdrew but the opposite leg extended and that's why it's called cross extension so those are just some examples of different types of clinical clinical reflexes that you may even try at home However, the painful one you might not want to try, but in order to see these two types, you would have to pinch someone's toe or foot or finger and or some other body part. Okay, so that would cover these uh, different types of reflexes. Now, uh, let me see if I can find the diagram from a moment ago, from earlier after the break. Okay, so I'm com coming back to one of the previous diagrams in chapter 13. And going back to this figure, 13.4, to discuss tracts. Now, you all know what the definition of a tract is. Okay, a tract is just a bundle of axons, right, that go up and down the central nervous system. In this case, up and the spinal cord. So those are tracts, bundles of axons that go up and down the central nervous system. Now, in the spinal cord, we do have two types of important tracts. We have ascendant tracts, which go up the spinal cord to the brain, and we have descendant tracts that come down the spinal cord and go to different effectors, effectors perhaps like muscles. Okay. 
So let's take a look at these two tracks, ascendant tracks. Ascendant tracks, which send signals up the spinal cord to the brain, are functionally classified as being as being what? Any idea? Ascendant tracks would be sending signals upward. Signals that are what type of signals? Sensory, very good. Okay. So ascendant tracks are actually functionally sensory. Whereas descendant tracks, therefore, would be the opposite. Descendant tracks would be, let me use a different color, would be motor. Okay, good. Motor. So ascendant tracks send sensory signals upward. Descendant tracks send motor downward through the spinal cord. Okay, and downward and then to be distributed this way through the uh, out this way and go to different effectors right where sensory signals come in from some type of from some type of tissue like skin or uh, like we saw a moment ago um, a tendon from a body part and then send the signals up right now in this case, we can just simply classify them as ascendant and descendant tracks, and now you know the function for both tra type of tracks. Now, one last thing also I want to talk about tracks is that tracts, as they go up or down especially, as tracts go down the spinal cord, they will often and usually cross over, and I'll draw an arrow here, in fact, a few arrows, So as tracks go down the spinal cord, they will cross over at some level, either in the spinal cord or in the brainstem. And crossing over is a term that we call, let me write that term down. Oops, first put a line there. So I'm putting with these green lines that you see there. Crossing over when signals and nerve, uh, you know, when uh, nerve fibers cross over to the opposite side, we say that it becomes contralateral. Contralateral. Okay, so there you can see that descendant tracks or ascendant can do that also, but descendant tracks cross over to the opposite side, meaning that. Signals coming from your brain down the spinal cord, from one side of the brain and spinal cord, let's say the right side of your brain and spinal cord, then will cross over and cause movement of the opposite side of the body. So with your right brain, you actually cause movement of the left side of your limbs. The same thing with the opposite side, with your left side of the brain, signals go down the spinal cord and then cross over to the opposite side which would be the right parts of your body therefore that is very interesting and something that uh, is uh, interesting to know because when a person has a tumor growth or lesion or damage to one side of the brain it often affects the opposite side of the body and that's because of the fibers crossing over. Now, the crossing over to the opposite side is called, let me write that down in capital letters, decusation. Decusation means the crossing over to the other side to make the signals become contralateral. Decusation. Decusation means the crossing over of the signals and tracts. Now much of it, a lot of it happens, let me show you with this next figure, figure 13.5. You can see here some motor signals, or, or actually these are sensory signals. Sensory signals you can see also cross over. But I'm looking for motor signals because I like that one. Because it usually, usually happens here in this part. Look at the motor signals coming down in the green lines. 
they come down the spinal cord into the brainstem and they cross over to the other side of the body. They cross over generally here at a part in the brainstem called the called the medullary pyramid. Okay. Now you may not be sure where the medullary what the medullary pyramid is or where they are. We will look at that next week with the study of the brain stem. Okay, but for now, you see there the pyramids. Okay, the pyramids, and in the pyramids is where you have most of the decusations, the crossing over of the tracts, these motor tracts, these descendant tracts. Okay, so now you can see why a person can suffer damage to the opposite part of the body when their other side of the brain was affected. And here's a well, not necessarily this famous person who died a couple of years ago, I believe, but uh, Stephen Hawkins had some other serious medical condition. However, he was he was paralyzed most of his body. In fact, even his speaking was paralyzed later in his life. Uh, but anyway, uh, yes, that would be some things here associated with the spinal cord.